Hey, Ultimate Music Teachers! Why is the primary stage of piano lessons so important? That's the question of the day. Go ahead and share in the chat box with us why the primary stage of piano studies is so important for you. Whether you're teaching beginner students of any ages, what do you think is the one thing you need to remember? I also want to invite you to join the Ultimate Music Theory Facebook group and become part of the UMT community of musicians, students, and educators, where you will have access to great ideas, support, and networking opportunities to help you achieve your musicianship goals. I'm Glory St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory, and my very special guest today is Irina Gorin. She is the author of Tales of a Musical Journey, which has been translated into 14 languages. Can you imagine that? And is about to share the three essentials for teaching piano at the primary stage for young beginners. Welcome, Irina. Hello, everyone. And I'm very happy and grateful to Glory to be here joining this interview. Thank you, Glory. Yes, and, and we're excited to be hearing all the great things that you're gonna be sharing with us today. Um, Irina Gorin is a masterclass educator. She's a judge for national and international piano competitions. She holds a master's degree in piano performance, piano pedagogy, chamber orchestra, and accompaniment, and is recognized as one of the most prominent pedagogues for children. Irina Gorin also travels the world, how exciting, conducting workshops for piano teachers. And we're also going to be sharing one of her upcoming events for piano teachers, which is going to be held in Calgary, Alberta. So you want to make sure that you stick around for that one. I'm going to invite our guests to just go ahead and say hi. We want to know there is Alina Cobb. Hello. Uh, just go ahead and uh, share with us in the chat box so we know that you're there. You can kind of say hello to Irina. So let's get started, Irina, before we sort of delve into all the great tips you have for us today. How did you get started in your music lessons? It was a long time ago. <laughs> I was five years old when I started um, individual piano lessons, but the musical education in uh, Ukraine when I was born, where I was born, is quite different. Yeah. I was in music school for seven years and then I went to music college for a bachelor degree for another four years and then five years of conservatory and that that was my 20 years long education yes wow and you know when you think back I mean there you were this young which is why it's so important what we're talking about today because there you were this young child you know, little did your teachers know that you would become the master that you are today. And it's so important to really understand how to teach those young children because you don't know what they're going to become. Absolutely. And, you know, why is the primary stage of piano studies so important? And maybe you could just define what are the ages? Like, what are we thinking when we're talking about the primary stage? Primary stage actually doesn't reflect the ages of the student. It could be as early as three, four years old, or it could be a senior citizen trying to take piano lesson. But um, it, it's a beginning stage when uh, the students acquire uh, basic technical skills and start developing their musical abilities so they can reach their potential and expand their horizons whenever they want. Yes. And I think, you know, you're right in that, you know, oftentimes we think of students starting piano lessons um, are as, as these young children ages three and four and five, maybe even up to eight. But there's many young um, students, or I should say beginners, uh, that can be teenagers that maybe said, you know what, I always wanted to learn how to play the piano. And so whatever age they are, I think the oldest piano student that I ever had, she was 78 years old. And it was her very first beginning piano lesson. And yeah. she just wanted to play, I think, uh, um, what was the song she said? Oh, New York, New York. 
That was her goal. <laughs> she just wanted to play it. But I think one of the things that we talked about earlier before we went live was sort of the three tips that we want to really ensure that we are developing with this primary stage of education. Um, could you maybe share those tips with us? Of course. Um, to grow a healthy, educated person uh, with uh, appreciation to music and arts, first of all, we need to develop musical abilities of the student of any age, mm -hmm. which includes musical ear, appreciation to music, uh, knowledge of theory to understand what music is about, uh, to develop imagination so the person can uh, listening to the music, feel deeper and in turn express their feelings. We want them to learn the skills of composition and improvisation, as well as if, to become fluent sight readers, because of course not all our students are going to be concert pianists. Yeah. So this is very important. Um, another uh, tip is for a piano teacher to continue growing their skills as teachers and as pianists, to learn every day from all possible sources. And the third tip that I feel as important is uh, involvement of piano parent. So these three things, piano teacher, piano student, and piano parent are one team and if one of the ingredients is missing the student is not going to progress yes absolutely and i think as a music educator we really do want to develop that imagination and creativity because when a child hears music they almost have a more vivid imagination than an adult does so sometimes it causes a lot of curiosity if you just say what do you think when you play this and and i know you've used a lot of imagination um in your um in your workbooks that you share with uh, you know teachers and as i said you know translated into 14 different languages um you know it really allows them to have that imagination musical abilities and i think one thing too that i know that you're very passionate about and that is the the healthy technique habits um, can you maybe just explore a little more on on what what we can uh, you know do for developing healthy technique habits? Uh, absolutely. Uh, what I realized uh, from my experience that not many teachers understand is that playing the piano requires muscle contraction or tension. Yeah. And uh, one of the most essential skills every student has to acquire is how to quickly and easily switch from tension to relaxation. And we need to start teaching that from the very first lesson. And if we don't, the student will continue uh, keeping that tension, which will eventually bring to bad injuries that can prevent that person <clears throat> excuse me, from playing the piano at all. Yes. And <clears throat> I, I was just going to say, I, I, I firsthand remember as I was working on my ARCT and, and expanding my hand to reach a tenth, and I practiced for probably five to seven hours a day in preparing for my exam and performance. And I too developed this big lump on my hand, not attractive, but sometimes, you know, you don't know, should I just push through it and should I keep practicing or should I stop, especially when you're so close. And I think it came from my teachers, maybe lack of, of knowing how to teach healthy technique, which I never really heard of before. I just sort of practiced it. So how, how can we develop that healthy technique? <clears throat> Um, I did a very uh, deep research because my education in Ukraine was quite different than education in America. Mm -hmm. And um, moving to United States and started 
starting teaching students with American methods showed me a huge difference of approach. Yeah. Um, at first, I was fascinated with the uh, amount of method books that uh, were very attractive for young kids. And I was very excited to teach with them. But then after a couple of years, I realized that my students are all very tense. They have no imagination. They have no freedom of the body to express their feelings. And they had actually no feelings. And I started to trying to figure out what what uh, the co uh, what the problem, what's the cause of that. Yeah. And remembering how I was taught and rereading a lot of literature, I realized that approach of teaching in Eastern Europe goes from training the whole body at first and big groups of muscles to control before we start controlling fingers. What happens with fixed five-finger position, kids start using isolated fingers before they know about wrist or the arm or the entire body yeah. or the sitting posture. And that brings to very dry, inexpressive sound as well as a lot of tensions that student doesn't know how to uh, relax. Yeah. How are we going to fix that tension? You know, when we have, um, we talk about, you know, the method books. And of course, um, you're an author. You've written this amazing series. Can you just maybe share the story? You know, as an author myself, people often ask me, well, Glory, how did you get started? You know, you you, you start with one book and then, or, or was it a book or was it a worksheet? How, like, how did you get started writing your, your series? Yes, it's actually an interesting story. I was never uh, thought I would become an author, but uh, about 10 years ago, um, I got a new student who was a four-year-old, and I've never taught students that young before, and she was very tiny with tiny puny hands, and I, I just thought, how am I going to teach her? How can I make this tiny hand to stretch over five grown-up keys? <laughs> and how to uh, bring the concepts of music theory to, to that young age? And I decided to try to write stories for each lesson, like a book with uh, fairy tale characters, with the uh, uh, animal characters. So to, to make her imagination work and to help her to remember the sequence of concepts. Yes. And it worked really, really well. I was very happy. And of course, I was able to implement uh, technical skills also with the help of different toys, which became characters of the story. Yes. But it happened at the time that my young colleague was observing my lessons and she was fascinated with how things went with this little four-year-old, Chin Yao. She was recording, she was doing video recording of these lessons and she asked my permission to post them on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, of course, why not? It, it didn't matter for me at that time. But since the first video, I started receiving very many messages from teachers from many countries, and they were all asking what method book you are teaching from. <laughs> and I said, it's not a method book, it's just my own approach. It's just mm -hmm. what I created. And I've got tons of requests to make it public. And that's when, after a year of teaching and seeing the results, I decided to publish it. and. Now this book is used in more than 90 countries and teachers, teachers actually ask me permission to translate them. It's, I, I'm not finding those translators. They come to me and ask me because they feel uh, it's the best approach. Yes. Well, congratulations on your success. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. And I do have a question for our um, viewers today. So if you could um, please share with us, um, what is the ages that you have started students? So have you started a beginner 
at age four? Have you started a beginner who's a teenager? Have you started a beginner who is, you know, um, a senior? Go ahead and share with us what is the age, what's the age that you have started students? Because it's very interesting. Irina is sharing with us. Um, obviously, today we're talking more so about the younger beginners, but I'm curious to see um, what is the age that you have started your students? So go ahead. That is my question for our viewers today. And another question, Irina, we talked about was, you know, you were asked like, uh, you know, what really motivated you to start your musical journey. And and I believe it was just probably that that sometimes the, the world has a plan for us and we don't even know it. I think it was just perhaps your love of teaching and and it really evolved, didn't it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in addition to the teaching of your of your or creating as an author, the workbooks, um, tell us a little bit about what you are now doing to help teachers, because it's one thing to buy um, a book. But then if you don't have the knowledge in how to really teach effectively, sometimes you're just buying another book. Uh, so tell us about the program that you created to help to help teachers. Absolutely. To answer the first question about the ages of beginners, I used to start any age. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the time, I realized that I love teaching young students. Yes. I don't know, maybe because I was growing older and <laughs> really loved that age or my kids grew up and I was missing that age. <laughs> But um, working with young three, four, five-year-old, six-year-old beginners is so rewarding. They're so natural. They can keep their feelings and seeing their reaction on stories, on images. It, it's just so precious. I, I love it. I love it. But I did uh, teach all ages in my life, and now... Uh, I live in China, even though now I'm in America. I teach in college, master degree students, and those are students of in their 20s, and they are advanced students, so I enjoy all kinds of teaching. But my real passion is with those little beginners. Yes. You know, I taught um, young beginners as well for many, many years, and there is just something magical about having those young little three and four year olds and even five year olds. Um, my daughter started um, formal piano lessons. She was um, two years old, um, just just shy of her third birthday. And I think my attitude was as long as she is starting to learn and have fun and just getting the process down, you know, I never expected her to, to have the success that she has today. She's a music producer. She's an accomplished, you know, pianist, multi-instrumentalist and a singer and songwriter and all of that. But who knew that that would be her life's journey when she just started out as little. But I think when you have those little ones and you know, because you teach them, they their imagination there is just no stopping them like they just think of course i can do it i'm three i'm four i can do this and their imagination is is just i think so exciting and fun to explore and i guess maybe in connecting with other teachers and you connect with a lot of teachers around the world what do you see as maybe the one thing that's missing from today's teaching techniques to to help their students Yes, uh, I think the main flaw in uh, teaching these days is a huge dependence on method books. Yeah. We need to remember that it's just a book. It probably is created to help students to review the concept that were learned before, yeah. but it's not... Uh, in, in entire an entire teaching the teacher is the core the teacher is the one who creates a bond with the student who becomes a mentor and psychologist and doctor and nurse and mother and friend for that student we cannot delete this element and um 
uh, what I see when I work with teachers through the workshops, they, they follow every page of the method book and they don't explore uh, other opportunities and other sources that can teach the student to become better musician and better person. Okay. And there are tons of pieces written for students by uh, immortal composers like Tchaikovsky and Bach and Beethoven. And there's so many absolutely wonderful pieces written by living composers, introducing children to new styles of music, to new uh, capacities of using our instruments, for new ways to use our instruments. And if we're stick only, uh, stuck only to the method books, we don't see any of this mm -hmm. and we don't use. and. Uh, I think the worst of it, children don't develop taste to classical music. They don't develop appreciation to classical music because they don't experience it. For years, they are uh, playing those in, uh, instruction, instructional pieces in five-finger position being stuck to C major, G major, and F major, right. not being to experience all the colors and shades and emotions of real music. Yes, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think one of the things too is that when we explore and give young children an opportunity to listen to classical music and to learn, you know, the pieces that they can manage, they will um, I think, as you said, use all the colors and and it leads them to composition because they might hear, you know, Bach's minuet and say, well, I, I want to write a minuet. Why can't I? Of course you can. You know, uh, Mozart wrote when he was young. You can do it. I think it really is encouraging young students. And I also agree that when, uh, you know, sometimes you may um, buy a method book and your ch your student's not doing well and you think, oh, well, it's because of this book I'm using. I'll, I'll go get a different book. And then you get the same results. And really the issue is not so much with what you're doing with that book, but it's that you don't have the knowledge in how to teach the book with intention. And I think that's the beautiful thing about your program, Irina, is that you are creating education and workshops for teachers and teaching them how to use your method and get the results that you're getting. Uh, Sandra Scruton, who is from uh, Calgary, Alberta, and I know you're traveling there uh, in July to do an upcoming event for music educators. And she also traveled to the United States to take your level one training. And she just raves about your program and says, oh my goodness, it has changed how I teach. It has helped my students that had injuries and I've been able to help them. They came perhaps from another teacher and said, I can help you with that because she now, and I know she's taking the level two training with you because she finally realizes, oh, I can learn this. Uh, it's funny, sometimes, you know, as young students, we think we reach a certain level in piano and oh, now I'll be a teacher. But really, we don't have the pedagogy behind us to have all the tools that we need to really teach effectively, especially to those beginners, because that's where it all starts, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would uh, notice that when I was a student in colleges, I had at least nine years of very intensive pedagogy courses, which included group lessons. Uh, uh, repertoire studies, uh, teaching under supervision of the master students, but nowadays college students receive one, maybe two semesters of pedagogy courses, and all they do, they just look through method books. And now, as I'm teaching as professor uh, at Chengdu University in China, uh, and I have those two semesters to give my students everything I can. First semester, we really work on technique and development, development of musical abilities. But the whole second semester is going to be devoted to studying children's repertoire because this is the most important thing 
in developing this connection with music and uh, developing the interest. Our students are bored because they cannot explore and get interested in different styles and appreciate the beauty of the music. Yes. Absolutely. And I think, too, when, when we're really getting to know our students, too, I mean, we have visual learners, uh, visual auditory kinesthetic learners. We really need to identify our learning style. How do we teach so that we can communicate effectively to each one of these? You know, not only do they have different learning styles, but they have different little personalities. Some of them are, you know, towards goal setters. Some of them are away from goal setters. Sometimes we have to play the I bet you can't do that game. And other times we have to play the I know you can do that game. So it is really a, a skill that needs to be studied so that you can be as effective as possible in your teaching. Absolutely. There are no two the same students and there are no two the same lessons. Every lesson, even though it requires a lot of preparation from teacher, but it is improvisation because we need to sense when student gets bored or tired and we need to change activities. So we have to have a whole toolbox of strategies and activities yeah. and toys and props to ignite that imagination. Mm -hmm. This learning process can be successful only if student is an active participant of the lesson, but not passive observer. Yes, yes. And we talked about three things that that I definitely wanted to uh, expand on today and uh, three tips that you shared with me earlier. Um, and the first one was professional growth of the teacher. So can you elaborate on on how we can, you know, have professional growth as a teacher? You know, there are uh, very many different ways to uh, improve our teaching skills. Mm -hmm. First of all, thanks to technology these days, we have Facebook, we have YouTube. These are wonderful ways to communicate with other teachers, with uh, parents, with uh, teachers across the world. Uh, YouTube shows us historical master pieces and performances and children playing. So these are great sources. Another one, uh, musical magazines that consist of wonderful articles written by uh, very knowledgeable people. Uh, we might agree with some, we might not agree with some, but it all gives us food for thoughts. Yes. I use every opportunity to read another book about piano pedagogy, about piano technique, about pianists, about composers. Um, and of course, workshops, workshops, video master classes, everything I can find time to do and I'm trying to learn every day. But of course, teaching student, every new student brings us new experience and new knowledge. Yes, absolutely. And I invite our, our uh, viewers today, whether you're watching live with us right now or whether you're watching the replay, go ahead and share with us what are you doing now to, um, to work on your own professional development. So whether you are a teacher, a student, uh, a playing musician, performing musician, what are you doing to work on your professional development right now? Go ahead and share that with us in the chat box. Um, so uh, Antonio uh, says, so grateful for this information, Irina. I stopped my student uh, because I was planning to watch this. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important to have that education. So thank you for joining us in, the, in our video. We've got some great viewers on with us today. The second tip that we were going to share today, other than our own professional development, and the second tip was parental involvement in the lessons. So how does that work exactly? Uh, when I meet potential family uh, of students, I always give them uh, a picture that I have from my pedagogy professor. 
it's a child sitting on a flying bird and the bird has two wings. One is a teacher and one is a parent. If one wing is missing, the child is gonna fall. And a lot of parents don't know that. Uh, they have no sources. We don't have courses or study groups to become piano parents yeah. uh, in colleges or parental groups, uh, nothing. So they, they don't have any sources to get this information. That's why I feel parents' education in the first years of uh, piano lessons are as important as teaching the student because parents, they become our assistants at home. We teachers can teach only certain amount of minutes a week. The rest of the time, parents has to help the child, especially if child is so young as four, six, eight years old. They have to become our assistants and help them. And it also teaches parents to find those communication ways with children to avoid arguing, to avoid uh, tears, and encourage them to get better. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I was blessed to, to grow up in a musical family. And when I was little, I started piano lessons when I was little. And we couldn't afford a metronome at that time. And I still remember my father had his pencil. And he would sit with me at every lesson when I was little and he would tap the piano so that he would be my metronome. And there was a little dent in the piano. And, um, you know, my father obviously has passed away, but I always loved the little dent. <laughs> it just yeah. reminded me of his encouragement in staying in time. And, and he was my coach. And as I had my own children and they were involved in music lessons, I too, I, I had, you know, I didn't teach my own children. I had a professional, you know, teacher other than myself, obviously teach them, but I was their coach. And I so agree with you that we need to encourage parents and help them understand that when you're registering your child for music lessons, it's not just drop them off once a week, see you at the recital at the end of the year. It is an activity just like brushing your teeth. You need to do it every day. And, you know, we need to be uh, helping parents know, how can I help my child? Because if you don't tell them, how would they know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe we, could, uh, we should give stickers to parents if they. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, another thing that a lot of parents uh, don't consider is that practicing the piano is very solitary activity when children might feel lonely. Yeah. And that was the biggest problem for me when I was a child and had to practice. Sending your child to the piano and say practice for half an hour sounds like a grounding, not uh, like <laughs> encouraging to get better at something or enjoy something. Yes. I remember when I was little and I was sent to practice, I was knocking on my neighbor's doors and asked them, asking them to sit next to me while I practice because I felt very lonely. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so true. I, you know, I, and it's funny because now that you're saying that I, I do remember my mom and she would say, you know, I'm, I'm just going to sit here and read a book while you're practicing. And I said, wow, why are you in here? And she said, just because I don't want you to be lonely. And you're right, oftentimes, and if you think about it, you know, and I have done just as an experiment, um, I have said to my student, now I want you to show me how you're going to practice. And I'll just sit here, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just give you five minutes of silence. Show me what you do. And I've often thought to myself, if, if they can't practice for five minutes while I'm sitting there saying nothing, how can you expect them to practice for 30 minutes all by themselves at home? It's not going to happen. So involving the parents in whatever way that is best to communicate with them, I think is essential. As you said, you want to keep your wings going <laughs> and you need both of them. You absolutely yes, need them. Yes. And work in sync. They have to work in sync. They have to be in the same boat. Yes, absolutely. And I guess our tip number three is musical growth for each student. So what do you mean by musical growth? 
Um, again, because teachers depend so much on method books, they don't um, ignite the imagination of the child. Uh, and that's why I, um, I feel we need to, as teachers, we need to try to introduce our students to more activities such as improvisation and composition. And uh, we need to teach them to listen to the music because it is a skill too. Uh, think of how musician listens to music and non-musician, it's very different things. But the more you know how to listen, the more you can appreciate. So I teach children how to listen with different ways, with eyes closed, with um, expressing their feelings with the stories or pictures, with elementary conducting, analyzing some elements, elements of music. So they become active listeners, not passive. Mm -hmm. uh, I always, again, it's not only the students, it's both parents and students. Uh, I always encourage them to attend live concerts because YouTube videos are great, but they cannot be compared with live concerts. All my students subscribe to music magazine, Piano Explorer. Mm -hmm. They receive assignment to listen to certain uh, piece of music every week. And I prepare a worksheet where I ask them questions about this music. They also learn about composers and pianists, very famous pianists. So we need to grow them organically, holistically. Yeah. Uh, not to make them concert pianists, but to teach them to become better humans. Yes. And, and you know, you absolutely said it in, in the whole listening aspect, because when you, when you see um, uh, people, you know, of any age at a concert, uh, there are some that are kind of oblivious to the music and will applaud at everything, no matter what. <laughs> and there are others that truly understand the mastery of the performance, the message that it conveyed to the listener because they, they are good at listening. And I think when you give students an opportunity to learn those listening skills at a young age, it gives you a deeper appreciation for the music rather than just, oh, that was nice. Well, no, it was better than nice. It was, you know, they could go on and expand it. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity that you are providing for not only your students, but even today what you've shared with us as educators, I'm sure it's making the wheels turn for our listeners because I know it is for me as well. I'm thinking, oh, I could do more. I could do more. I think I really like the idea of, of perhaps doing more live concerts. My students actually perform at, um, there's a program here called Musicians in the Making, where studios such as myself can have our students perform before the live concert. It's just sort of an opportunity for them to be in the concert hall setting. But I think it would be important for them to attend even more concerts than just the two that we do per year, because you listen differently and you appreciate differently. And by doing a little worksheet as to, you know, how did that make you feel or was it expressive or, or did you hear the, you know, contrast in the dynamics or the tempo changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It really is very effective, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, so how can we learn more about, I know you've got some wonderful upcoming events. How can we connect and learn more about you and your materials? Um, my materials are uh, on my website, uh, irinagorin.com. I'm also an administrator of Facebook group called Piano Pedagogy for Beginners, Tales of a Musical Journey. And it's a very active forum of more than 5,000 teachers from around the world who share their success stories, ask questions, and we can all help them. I've also created a forum, very uh, young one, um, Parent, piano parent teacher support group, yes. um, support community where parents meet teachers and learn more about each other because 
communication is the key. Sometimes we, we don't understand why parents are unhappy and parents don't understand what they did wrong. The teacher is unhappy. So that group is really uh, to, to improve that communication. So we work together uh, to improve our students' progress and results of our teaching. And I think when you have parents in that group as well, um, you know that they are truly committed to helping their children in their education. And, you know, how would they know? They, they don't know. They just, maybe it's their firstborn child and they have a little four-year-old that they want to, and they don't know how to, how to help their child. Um, and if their child says, I want to quit my piano lessons, well, maybe the parent needs to look at what are they doing? You know, they say, well, my child's not interested. Well, perhaps they're not interested because you're not supporting them. You just tell them to go to the piano and, and it's lonely over there. But if you work together and understand that it can be a musical journey, then I think that's a great support group. And I'm so happy that you've created that for parents and teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're, they're really benefiting from that information. And I think as teachers, sometimes we just assume that parents know what to do but they don't and we really need to educate them step by step yeah. for example i'll just tell you um piano posture sitting position is one of the most important basic skills yeah. and we, uh, every lesson for a while i explain to parents and they seem to understand and then i ask them to send me a picture of how a child practices at home and it looks nothing <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of communication, constant um, asking them questions, showing your interest uh, and helping them, it, it's really important. That's how they grow interest and they create, develop that bond with teacher and with child and they have something in common. Yeah. It's not the things that separate them, it's things that bring them together. Yeah, absolutely. I love your idea of taking a picture from home and, and bringing it to your next class. I, I have a little story to share with you, Irina. I have one student and every time she comes to her lesson, she always said, oh, I played it better at home. I played it better at home. So one day I said to her, well, I'll tell you what, since you always play it perfectly at home, that's what you tell me, I would like you to bring me a video next week. And if you play it perfectly, you know, and you're going to show me that you did that, then I'll give you $10. And so she said, okay, fine. So she came to her lesson the next week and I was really looking forward to seeing this video. And so she said, oh, I brought the video. And I said, great, let me have a look. So I looked at it and of course she actually played it quite well. And I said, congratulations. And as I had promised, you know, I gave her the $10. And then she said to me, Miss Glory, I have a little confession to make. And I said, okay, and what is that? She said, I practiced so hard this week because every time I looked at myself on video, I realized I was not good at all. <laughs> and she said, I just like recorded the video today because she said, I've been practicing so hard. But she said it made me realize that what you think you're doing, you know, perhaps you're not until you see yourself on video and say, oh, I that my mouth was open the whole time that I was playing. They're not aware of their physiology. Absolutely. Until they see it. But anyway, it was quite funny. And she said she had a, a wonderful learning experience because she realized that what she thought she was doing is not really what she was doing. And, and I agree, it's important to take pictures or to take a video. I do that quite often with my students so they get to see themselves. And um, they usually think, oh, I didn't think I looked like that. I, I didn't think I was this, kind of like that. This is another reason why parents need to be with the students when they practice. Yes. I see a lot of questions from parents and teachers. When can I stop uh, sitting with my child or my student while they practice and it's uh, quite simple to answer uh, because children don't have 
developed analytical and critical skills until they reach age of 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Ask uh, any student, uh, seven, eight years old, how they just played, 99% of them will say, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful and there is mistake after mistake they just it's not because they're bad but they don't have developed listening skills and they don't have those skills that their brain can develop to certain age mm -hmm. that's why i tell parents until the child turns 10 11 years old and can analyze what they did then you have to be with them. You have to encourage them and you have to point out to certain things to help them see those yeah. holes. I, I thought you were going to say that you have to sit with your child until they get married and move out. But <laughs> <laughs> that would be good too. Uh, there is, uh, we have some questions here for you I should share. So um, Elena says, thank you for this. She said, I believe it's very important to visit the places where classical music originates from, uh, not to lose the connection with the roots and also exploring a uh, nationalistic uh, tendency in music. I'm a professional pianist, chamber musician and pedagogue, currently traveling to several countries uh, in Czech Republic and London, UK and performing. I'm also researching and talking with teachers and other musicians always trying to inspire conversation, how things are done. Uh, she says, in Europe, they get it right with music education, but the new generation is already different compared to the older generation. And I agree with that. And I think it's because now we have so many opportunities to, to learn in different ways. And obviously with the internet and, you know, 50 years from now, the conversation will be different again. But because you and I have lived through this, you know, I don't want to say how old I am, but I used to type on a manual typewriter. And when the electric typewriter came out, that was a big deal. <laughs> and then the computer and then the Internet. And now, of course, the rest is history. But I do think that teachers that started teaching, um, you know, way back when, 30 years ago, sometimes it might be uh, challenging to think, wow, like, look at all these opportunities I have now I can learn and look at all the teachers that connected with you, Irina, because of all the YouTube videos that you did, like that would never have happened. And those teachers would have never had the opportunity to learn from you if you wouldn't have so generously shared that information and said, here, if this can serve you, then I'm happy, I'm happy to provide that for you. So thank you for that information, right? I'm very grateful for technology. For Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, Antonio o. Antonella, I'm probably not pronouncing the name correctly, says, I really want to purchase Irina's online course. Is the program exploring the same topics um, about the live event? So it's funny because you and I were talking about that today. If you can't attend a live event, you know, how can we purchase the course? So I would suggest that you go to her website, um, and you can, uh, I'm sure there's an option there to communicate, to check with you, connect with you, uh, or um, Irina will be back in the chat box after our interview and she can uh, private message you and, and get you all of that information. What is very exciting is that there is um, the your uh, masterclass that's coming up um, and it is in Calgary, uh, Alberta. And uh, I know Sandra Scruton, she's one of our Ultimate Music Theory certified teachers. And she reached out to me and said, I must get this in Calgary and, you know, let's talk about this. So the event is Calgary, Alberta uh, at the Steinway Piano Gallery of Calgary. And it is on July the 16th and 17th. So level one is a two day event. And I believe you can also register, sorry, level one is for two days. And then uh, level two is on July the 18th and the 19th. And there's still a couple yeah. of openings there. Uh, so just go ahead and leave us a little note in the chat box. I'll come in and leave some information in thereafter just so that you can connect with Sandra Scruton. And I believe it is, uh, let me see if I have that ready for you. 
Um, yes, yeah, so it is scrutinpiano at gmail.com. And if you connect with Sandra, she will give you the information on how you can uh, get registered for that uh, live event in uh, Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada. So that will be very exciting. Can you share with us what other events are coming up for you? I know you are uh, going to be moving uh, over to China for a bit. Tell us about what's happening over there. Yes, I've been really enjoying uh, being a professor at uh, International College, working with master degree students uh, in piano and pedagogy. And really, it, it was a great experience. I am looking forward to continue in the next years to come. Um, I also started, um, I actually already created next level of repertoire books that can be used by students right after Tales of a Musical Journey. Again, to fill this gap between the method book and real classical music with pedagogical pieces and pieces uh, for really young kids that should be short, concise, and with very vivid images. So kids will ignite their imagination and continue enjoying their lessons. Yes. These are quite different. They don't have the storyline like tales, but they uh, reinforce and continue developing the skills acquired in Tales of a Musical Journey. Um, I am planning to create video course for workshop, online workshop. The existing video course is 52 lessons for teachers who decide to work with Tales of a Musical Journey, taking them step by step through each concept and each uh, teaching approach, but it's not the same as workshop. It's a very different course. Yes. And I think sometimes it's nice to do both. If you have the opportunity to attend a live event, it's exciting because there's interaction and you can ask questions right away. And it's also a wonderful opportunity to have access to an online course where you can review the concepts if you'd like to go at your own tempo when it's convenient for you, because uh, not everyone is able to, able to travel. So I think it's yeah. kind of a win-win that you're offering both, that you can take it as an online course or you can attend a live event or you can do both and just be submerged in the tales of a musical journey and yeah, I, I think that you know through your years of teaching I'm sure your students have inspired you too because it takes a lot of imagination to create tales of a musical journey and I'm sure that they've shared a few of their adventures with you <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it's really um you know brought to life uh, in your sharing yeah. uh, on through the materials that you've created it through pedagogy your live events your online uh, teacher training and of course your uh, your work over in China with all these pedagogy you must be very excited with the new chapter that's coming it is a new chapter and I enjoy every minute of it um, I would mention another project and I would say it's my other baby is Carmel Clavier Piano Competition, International Piano Competition for young children that is already in sixth year and it starts next week. I hope to be able to stream it live. Uh, it's a very unique competition because First of all, it's in absolutely gorgeous state-of-the-art venue, concert hall. And also we have five com competitive categories that is not only solo piano, but also concerto, um, duet, ensemble, and living composers, the contemporary composers category. And the competition is created the way that uh, 80% of students who participate, they are uh, awarded. We have absolutely amazing special awards. And please stay tuned. Uh, you can join our Facebook page, Carmel Clavier. You can uh, visit our website that tells about our international faculty and our, our events. And maybe next year you decide to join us in Carmel. 
That would be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much again for being my special guest today. I really appreciate you being here. I know our listeners have really enjoyed everything that you've shared with us. I want to wish you all the best on your continued musical journey. And we look forward to uh, hearing all about the uh, competition that's coming up that you'll be streaming live as well as your online courses and, of course, all of your live events. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. My pleasure, Glory. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for all the listeners, to all the listeners. Yes, absolutely. Have a musical day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.